Well, good morning. Let's stand together, please, and open your B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me, to the book of Ephesians, please, chapter 3. Ephesians. <laughs> yeah, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. Stand up tall on the Word of God, and can't remember the rest of it now, but um, anybody need a Bible? If you do, please just slip your hand up in the air. And good morning, Christian. And good morning, is it Lorraine? What is it? Alexandra. Alexandra. Well, I was way off. <laughs> I was way off. But the, the, yeah, uh, Christian just moved up here from Raul Reese's church. His mother attends there. And uh, Christian is a medical student. So. If you have a medical need during this service, call him, okay? <laughs> He'll be able to assist you, but uh, good to see all of you. We are in Ephesians chapter 3, and if you're just visiting with us this morning, we're going through the book of Ephesians little by little. It's called an in-depth study, and this morning we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Let me read them to you, okay? When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. Let's pray, please. Well, Father, we know some of this. We understand a little bit of it, but you've devoted such a large portion of Scripture to explain your wonderful, wonderful grace to the Gentile world. We can never, ever thank you enough, and we will forever be thanking you in glory for sending your Son to die upon the cross to pay in full for, for our sins. And then, Lord, to come to us and to visit us and to bring us under conviction and to make us aware of our need, of our sin, of unbelief, and of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Father, for saving all those here today who've come to faith, and for anyone, Lord, who is, has yet to come to faith, we pray this might be the day. What a wonderful day it would be, the 2nd of September, 2018, to see a soul saved in the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you. We pray your blessing now upon our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, the title to the message this morning is The Prisoner of the Mystery. The Prisoner of the Mystery. Paul, of course, as we know, had begun to think about the many blessings that God had brought into the lives of the Ephesians. And I might add, you don't know this. We haven't really said much about it. But, you know, the Ephesians lived in a place there in Greece that was horribly corrupt. Uh, they had a temple there, the Temple of Diana, and uh, it was filled with all types of immorality, all types of perversity, all types of drunkenness, corruption. It was a horrible place. Sin had invaded that city of Ephesus and had really destroyed so many lives, but God in his faithfulness brought the gospel of Christ to the city of Ephesus. And we don't know how many of them turned to Christ, but a number of them did, and there was then a fellowship there uh, the church of Ephesus. Paul actually pastored that church for a while. Later on, Timothy pastored it. And it's mentioned, of course, 
in the book of Ephesians, excuse me, in the book of Revelation in chapter uh, 4, excuse me, chapter chapter 3. It's the first of the seven uh, churches that Jesus uh, personally gave a letter to. But what Paul was saying, when I think of all these things, he marveled at how God had transformed these people. He had taken them out of one kind of lifestyle, out of the literal kingdom of darkness, and he had transferred them into the kingdom of light. And so uh, he was rejoicing to think about what God had done for them. And he started to pray for them, but then he stopped right on a dime. And he went into a long digression from verse 2 to verse 7, which is one long sentence. And then the digression continues from verse 8 to verse 13, in which both of those sections, what he does is he explains in detail what is called the mystery of Christ, the mystery of God, and the ministry that God had given to him. And then in verse 14 through about verse 22, he resumes his prayer for them. And so this morning, three short little uh, points here. Paul's role, R-O-L-E, Paul's role, Paul's regard, and then Paul's responsibility. Paul was an apostle of Christ. If you look back, please, with me in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, as he introduces himself and introduces the letter, he says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, the word apostle means a sent forth messenger or a messenger of Christ whom he sent forth into the world. And you'll notice there that Paul did not choose this uh, office of being an apostle, but rather Jesus chose it for him. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. The word choose is a interesting word. It means... Uh, it means to pick out as being the best and to decide on a course of action. So God picked out Paul for the best of his will and he decided on a course of action for Paul for the rest of his life. And so Paul explains his being an apostle. He explains that Jesus Christ chose him, he converted him, chose him, and sent him forth. And if you'll turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 26, Paul explains his apostleship. He does it a number of times in the New Testament, and it's very worth looking at each of the times, not all of them, but looking at a number of the times in which he explained uh, the fact that he was an apostle. In Acts 26, he was standing before uh, King Agrippa. And in Acts 26, verse 9, he begins. He said, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus of the Naz of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem, authorized by the leading priests. I caused many believers there to be sent to prison, and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priests. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, imagine that, about noon it was brighter than the sun, 
it shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, the language of the day, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles. And here's what he was sending them for. This is so beautiful. There in verse 18. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. It is uh, very descriptive in verse 18 of the sad condition of a person who is unconverted. Their eyes are closed, not their physical eyes, but their spiritual eyes are closed. They cannot see what you can see as a Christian. But through the ministry of the gospel, through the work of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of the gospel, God opens a person's eyes. Now, when a person's eyes are opened, it doesn't mean they're saved, but it means now at least they can see reality. So it was to open their eyes, and here then is the goal of the gospel. So they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Obviously, if you're blind, amazing grace, I once was blind. Once was lost and now I'm found. I once was blind, however it goes. I may have it mixed up. You got it, right? That ends our message today. Okay, goodbye. But um, if you can't see, you can't turn, can you? So what happens is God opens a person's eyes and they see, oh, I see who I am. I see who he is. Now I understand. I'm still not saved, but now I can make an informed decision. I realize I'm in darkness, but God's goodness is being poured into my life, and now by his grace, his goodness, I can turn from the power of darkness and the power of Satan to God. And then please notice what happens. And this happened to you when you were found and your eyes were opened and you were saved. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins. How about that? Hmm? Forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. One pastor said this to his church one Sunday, he said, Christ, this is regarding forgiveness and sins. He said, Christ has not cast his people's sins into the shallow water where they might be washed up again on the shore, but he cast them way out into the depths of the sea where they are drowned forever. They're gone, gone, gone. If you turn to Galatians, please, chapter 1. Paul adds very important information about his calling as an apostle. And through the message today and next week, we're going to see how important his apostleship was to all of us here today. But in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says, this letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, part of why he was saying this uh, in the opening of the letter is he did have to, he was establishing his authority 
with them because this particular letter was a corrective letter. And so he was letting them know, I have the credentials to say to you what I'm going to say to correct you. They were getting involved in works righteousness as a way of salvation, and he wanted to get them back to the grace of God. But what is interesting for you and I, and the point we're looking at, which is his role, is he says, I was not appointed by any group of people. So it's not as if two or three or four people said, hey, you know what, Paul? We've been looking at you. You'd make a great apostle. So go on and be one. So he wasn't made an apostle by a group of people or by any human authority the authority that had the right to do something like that, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, let me just stop here for a brief moment. We just read there in the book of Acts how violent he was. And he would even chase people into other countries. He would help get them arrested and when they were getting ready to be martyred, he'd stand up and witness against them. He was a vile, hateful man. He was a religious Pharisee of the highest degree. There was no one who was a better Pharisee than Saul was his name originally. And there he was on his way to do some of his horrible business and the unexpected happened. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him, and he was converted. And the Lord told him, he said, Now, Saul, I want you to go up into Damascus. I want you to go to a certain street called Straight, and you're going to find a disciple of mine there by the name of Ananias. And Ananias is going to help you and teach you and help get you going. And so you have to picture uh, what God did. You know how in your yearbook you have the most likely to succeed? I'm not sure if they have a category for the most likely not to succeed. I don't think they have one like that. But who would have thought he was like an ISIS guy? That's how that, you could put him right like that. Who would have thought that that guy would become the apostle. And by the way, there were a number of apostles. He had a very, very special, special calling by God. His calling was to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and to spread it out to the Gentile world. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so I'll, I'll pull back a bit. But this man, Ananias, the Lord also visited him before Paul got there or Saul, and he told Ananias, guess who's coming to dinner? Now, what would you think if somebody said, hey, the leader of ISIS is coming to your house tonight? You'd say, what? <laughs> well, that's essentially what it was, and Ananias was all shook up, and the Lord said, no, 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 don't you worry about it. He's one of mine now. So when that knock came on the door, you know, I can't help but think he was a little tentative and peeked out there, and, and he would have looked and seen the countenance. Saul was blinded by the way, and so he took him in, blinded by the light, nursed him and cared for him, and he went off preaching a few days later. And so how important, what great pains God went to to begin getting the gospel beyond the Jewish Christians. Did you know this, that the first Christians were Jews, converted Jews? And did you know this, they had no idea that God wanted to save non-Jews? Now, why would they think that? Well, the Jews were the very special people of God, weren't they? He, he started the Jewish race through Abraham, and out of all the nations and people groups in the world, he created the Hebrew people. He gave them his law. He revealed his glory to them. No one else, all of the pagans, had nothing to do with Jehovah. 
So now even as converted Jews, they retained in their own mind, well, we're Jews, we're God's people. He doesn't really have anything to do with other people. Well, he does. Jesus died not just for our sins, Paul, John said in 1 John 2, but for the sins of the whole world. And he had to really open the door and push them out into the Gentile world. And he specifically gave Saul the ministry to the Gentiles. If you turn, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul continues to describe his calling and his role as an apostle. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength to do his work. 1 Timothy 1, 12, I'm sorry. 1 Timothy 1, 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, my hatred, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. You know, later in one of his other pastoral epistles, he says that he was the chiefest of sinners, and he sets himself as an example. If God could save me, the worst of sinners, then he can save everybody else because he was the worst. Everyone else is not quite as bad as him. And interesting to note that Paul was the uh, dominant minister in the New Testament other than Christ. He was the standout person. For example, he wrote 13 of the 27 uh, books in the New Testament. Only Jesus was greater than him. And more than any other apostle, he presented the mysteries of the gospel. And we'll get into the meaning of the mysteries of the gospel next week. So that is just a nice, short, little brief look at the role, Paul's role. I'd like to look now at Paul's regard. Uh, looking at Ephesians 3, 1 again, I want you to notice how Paul regarded his imprisonment. When I think of all this, all the blessings, and I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. Now, this is very, very important. I would write this down if you're a writer, if you're a note taker. Paul had what we call a godly perspective on his circumstances. He had a godly perspective. Notice, he didn't say, I am Rome's prisoner, but rather he was Christ's prisoner. He wasn't in jail for a crime, per se, but rather for preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. His prison stint went for five years. He spent two years in Caesarea and then the last three years in Rome. He had been arrested uh, on false charges of bringing a Gentile into a forbidden area of the temple. And he went through a lot of different hearings with different authorities, and finally they shipped him off to Rome. And when he was in Rome, though he later wound up in a hole in the ground just before they executed him, at this point he was under house arrest. He had a guard, one or two guards with him 24 hours a day. And during that time he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Philippians, and he wrote Colossians. But his perspective is all important. What do we mean by that? Well, think of it this way. If all we can see is our immediate situation, then our circumstances control us. We feel good when our circumstances are good, but miserable when they're not. If Paul had been able to only see 
his circumstances, I think he would have given up quickly. He would have just said, forget this. You know, here I am, I'm trying to do a good thing for the Lord. I thought he wanted me to do this. And what's happened? I've been put in jail on, you know, illegally. Had he thought that his life was ultimately in the hands of his persecutors, his jailers, his guards, or the Roman government, he would long since have given up in despair. However, his perspective was a godly one, and he lived with total trust in God's purposes. So he looked at his circumstances, but he lived by trusting in the purposes and the promises and the truths of God. It, it, uh, doing that does not mean that he knew his future. He didn't fully understand his circumstances. He didn't know exactly what the purposes of God were, but he knew that he was safe and sound in the hands of God. That was the perspective that he had. That's why he could say, hey, listen, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was settled. He was settled there. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of John for just a moment. John chapter 10. Is this message starting to creep up on you in a kind of a good way, a little bit? Hmm? Well, it's not a creepy message, but it, it is going to creep up on you. <laughs> He was safe and sound in the hands of God. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 27 regarding his people. My sheep, John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I like what he said at the beginning, my sheep. That means you are no longer your own, but you've been purchased with a price. So if you're a believer, you belong to him. He regards you as his own, my sheep. A couple of things. They listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. In John 10, 28, here's what he gives his sheep. I give them eternal life. That's what you've been given by God. And they shall never perish. They will never perish. And then here's what I really love. No one can snatch them away from me. You know, um, to snatch something away, you know, you just quickly grab it. You take it. Jesus is saying nobody, that includes everybody, nobody can snatch my sheep away from me. Who's going to fight Jesus? Anybody want to raise their hand up here? You can't do it. And then in John 10, 29, and this is, this is so wonderful. I don't know if you've ever seen or paused to look at the first part of this verse. He says, for my Father has given them to me. So if you're a believer and you're in the hands of Jesus, who gave you to Jesus? God the Father said, I'm taking you, and I'm giving you to Jesus, and he's got you in his hands. And Jesus is speaking of his Father, and he says, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. And then he says, the Father and I are one, united. So the idea here, Paul's regard, he was at peace, not because of what he could see, but because of the word of God. I was sharing with first service today, uh, one of our board members and elders, a close friend of mine, close, one of the closest friends I have. Um, we were, over this last year, we were prayer partners and we've been praying about certain matters and, um, you know, challenges in the ministry and big challenges. And, um, I would say to him, I'd say, now, you know, I'm not worried about this. And he said, well, neither am I. I said, well, good. I said, we're just trusting God, aren't we? He said, yeah. 
So I said, you're not worried? And he said, no. And I said, well, I'm not worried either. You see, we were trusting in what God says, not in our circumstances. Now, you can do that, can't you? Huh? Now, what happens if you don't trust in God's word and you just start focusing on your circumstances? What happens? You go down, down, down. I like to illustrate it this way. If, if this is my life and, you know, I can see everything and if, if this is a troubling circumstance and I start focusing on this troubling circumstance, well, now I can't see you guys and the more I keep looking at it, I can't really see anything except my circumstance. And that's what happens to us. And that is a spiral pit that is every turn you take is worse than the previous one. And you get further down in the dumps. It is absolutely miserable, isn't it? And boom, a person can be brought up out of that horrible pit. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry, and he lifted me up out of a horrible pit, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he put a new song in my mouth, and many will hear it and praise the Lord. So Paul's regard, he's in prison. Well, yeah, it was a house arrest, but how would you like to be locked up? And, you know, you can't go anywhere. He saw himself as God's prisoner. And he, and he was able to do that because he specifically and personally trusted in the word of God. It's what we call uh, living and working not by sight, but by what? By faith. Listen to this very nice quote, and it's about faith. Faith is the soul's eye by which it sees the Lord. Faith is the soul's ear by which we hear what God the Lord will speak. Faith is the spiritual hand which touches and grasps the things not seen as yet. Faith is the spiritual nostril which perceives the precious perfume of our Lord's garments which smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia. Faith also is the soul's taste by which we perceive the sweetness of our Lord and enjoy it for ourselves. Romans 8, 28. You're familiar with that, aren't you? Let's turn there just to take a closer look at it. A lot of times we misquote that verse, and perhaps if you're newer in the Lord, uh, you... Um, might not know this verse. It's a wonderful verse. Some people have called it a pillow to rest your soul on every day. Romans 8, 28. It's really in the middle of an explanation about the Lord's plan from before the foundations of the world till the time he has you in glory. But in Romans 8, 28, here is what Paul said with absolute confidence. He said, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, does this say that God uh, brings, he only brings good things? No, it doesn't say that. It says he causes everything which can be a good thing, a difficult thing. He causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. So there's Paul in the Roman prison. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He isn't sure, you know, how this is all going to work out. But he rested in this. He knew, you know, somehow this is going to work together for good. And then how about in the book of James? past Hebrews and just before 1 Peter, way, way to the right in your Bibles. First Peter, uh, James chapter 1, please. Okay. 
It is really good to hear those pages turning, isn't it? There's two sounds that pastors like to hear. One of them are the sound of Bible pages turning. The other one sounds good, but it costs money, and that's when tractors start up for construction. It's a nice sound, but you got to pay the mortgage. <laughs> but in James chapter 1, in verse 2, by the way, Pastor Mike is teaching this book on Thursday night for our men's group there uh, here at the church. James chapter 1, verse 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, wanting nothing. There's a beautiful illustration uh, that helps us understand this, and it has to do with oysters. You know, oysters suffer affliction when they get a grain of sand lodged inside of their shells. No matter what they do, they can't get rid of it. It's like when you get something stuck in your eye. The sand gets lodged there, and it's irritating to the oyster. It's like a thorn. It drives them crazy. To bring comfort to their anguish, they begin to coat the grain of sand over and over and over again. Coating the sand doesn't get rid of it. It just comforts them over time. And over time, the coating of the grain over and over again produces something that costs a lot of money. It's called a pearl. Do you know what a pearl is? A pearl is the result of an irritated oyster. Out of that came something women place great value on. The pain resulted in beauty. The pain resulted in elegance. The pain results in something of high value. When God allows us to suffer, he is producing something precious. So the next time you're going through something and somebody says, hey, how are you doing? Say, you know, I'm just being an oyster. <laughs> what do you think they'd say? They'd say... Excuse me? Say, yeah, I'm just being an oyster. What do you mean you're being an oyster? Well, and then you can explain it to him. So that's how Paul regarded his life. That was his role, an apostle, and he saw his circumstances as under the control of God. And then thirdly, Paul's responsibility. Uh, the verse says in Ephesians 3.2, he says, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. That, that was the special responsibility. Read, let me read it again. Assuming, by the way, that you know that God gave me the special responsibility of, and here it is, extending his grace to you Gentiles. Now, you'll notice he says, assuming by the way that you know. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a phrase that means, I wonder if you know. It's a phrase that actually means, I know that you know this. Well, if he knew that they knew it, why did he repeat himself? Well, he had three good reasons that I can think of. Number one... First of all, Paul felt it wise to explain to them why he was suffering before he continued in his prayer for them. He takes great pains. Now remember, th this, these people had been brought to Christ by him. They, they loved him. They believed what he taught them. And now he's in prison and they're troubled about it. They can't figure it out. So he wanted to just, he was, he was thinking about everything that God had done for them and he wanted to pray for them, but he realized, you know, I need to first put some salve on the wound. I need to help them understand why I'm in this trouble and then I'll pray for them. So that's the first reason he repeated 
himself. The second reason is Paul understood the value of repetition. What does repetition do in teaching? Well, it helps to establish us, to ground believers in the truth, and especially if it's a new doctrine bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. God's truths are so marvelous and vast, we will never fully comprehend them in this life, no matter how many times we hear and study them. They're infinite. Even things we understand to some degree, we often forget and need to be reminded. The point is, none of us understands everything about a truth when we hear it for the first time. Somebody did ask the question to a teacher, what is the most effective way of teaching? And he said, it is repetition. And he's, you know, they're talking about different ways. And he said, well, what are some other ways that are helpful? He said, do you have a second way? He said, well, yeah, the second way is repetition. He said, okay, well, is there a third way? And he said, yeah, it's called repetition. We learn by repetition. So here is Paul wanting to comfort thee. They knew these things, but all their trouble had kind of confused them a little bit, so he's reminding them. Martin Lloyd-Jones said the essence of good teaching, he's one of the dead guys, by the way, the essence of good teaching is repetition. And the third reason Paul uh, repeated everything is it was simply a joy for him to remember what God had done in his life, and he wanted other people to rejoice. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5 for a moment, please. Romans chapter 5. You know when you're happy? When you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, boom, boom. What's the rest of that? When you're happy and you know it. Mm -hmm. Show it. When you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. When you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Are we happy? All right. Okay. In fact, we ought to be the happiest people on the planet. Why is that? We have eternal life. Can anybody take you out of the hands of Jesus? No. How about the Father? Who gave you to Jesus? The Father did. We are in good shape, folks. We were just singing about forever. Question, how long is forever? It's a long time, isn't it? It's not even a time. It's what? Forever. Paul rejoiced. In fact, in Romans 5.1, look what he says. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Romans 5.5, 5. and this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And if you'll go back, please, to Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment, verse 11. Ephesians 1, 11. This is a verse similar to Romans 8, 28. I'm glad God stuck these all over the Bible to remind us every once in a while, hey, guess who's in charge? Don't you worry. You may feel like you're in a bumper car, but guess what? You're not going out of bounds. I got gotcha. you. I'm taking care of you. Ephesians 1.11. Furthermore, in addition to what he had been saying, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God 
for he chose us in advance before the world was created. And what's the last part say? And he, let's read it together. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. Can we do that one more time? And he makes everything work out according to his plan. So if, if you're a Christian, isn't God making everything work out in your life according to his plan? Hmm, how about that? Charles Spurgeon said this. He called it the gospel of the happy God. Have you ever considered, he said to his congregation, how happy God must be? How supremely happy? No care, no sorrow can ever pass across his infinite mind. He is serenely blessed evermore. Now, when a man is miserable and of a miserable turn of mind, he as naturally makes people miserable as a foul fountain pours out foul water. But when a good man is superlatively happy, he imparts happiness. A happy face attracts many of us, and a happy temperament, a quiet mind, a serene disposition, why a man who has these inevitably tries to make others happy. And it is, I suppose, because God is infinitely happy that he delights in the happiness of his creatures. If he's happy, don't you think he wants you to be happy? You know, sometimes Christians, we don't look too happy, do we? We look kind of, we look like prune faces sometimes, don't we? You can, I've, I've, I've always liked to share this little illustration, you know. There you are with your prune face, you know, just. And you're trying to witness to somebody. You know, and you say to them, now listen, what I have to tell you, I want you to know something. Well, yeah, what is it? Well, if, you, if you'll do what I tell you, you can be just like me. <laughs> Run for the hills, right? Run for the hills. The Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus' great manifesto. Matthew chapter 5, 6, let me, 5, 6, and 7. What are the, what's the first part of the Sermon on the Mount? It's called the Beatitudes, isn't it? What is the one word that Jesus uses nine different times? It's the word blessed, which is translated happy. So in his biggest sermon, he starts off by talking about happiness. We are going to begin an in-depth study on the Sermon on the Mount Wednesday night in probably about three weeks from now. I think no more than three weeks. We will finish up John 14. But back to Paul's responsibility. The word responsibility means stewardship. A steward is a person who manages what belongs to another person. They take care of all the arrangements in a house, a big household. They plan things out. They purchase things. They assign duties. They don't own anything, but they've been given a job to do something for that person. Paul is saying, I have been given a responsibility, a stewardship by Jesus Christ. And what was his particular stewardship? It was to extend the grace of God to the Gentiles. Do you know what you are for the most part? Unless you're of Jewish descent, do you know what you are? You're a Gentile. You're a Gentile. Do you know when the, the, the gospel started making its way outside of the Jewish arena, we'll call it? It was through Paul the Apostle. What a story. This horrible man, hating Christians, chosen by God, called by God, to take that gospel to people like you and I, and 2,000 years later, you and I are enjoying the benefits of all the trouble that God went through. And Paul there in prison, he didn't know what the future held. 
here we are today rejoicing. We have the gospel. We as Gentiles, we have the gospel. In the weeks to come, in the couple of weeks, the two or three more weeks in chapter 3, uh, we're going to look more closely at his, uh, his ministry there of extending that grace. But here's something very important for all of us. What was true of Paul is also true of us, every one of us as Christians. God gave Paul a responsibility, and if you're a Christian, God has given you a responsibility. We are all stewards of God. We're not all apostles. We aren't called to the same ministry as Paul, but we all have a calling. We all have a stewardship that's been given to us by God, and we become faithful stewards when we use what we have to minister to those within the family of God and those who are outside of the family of God, being a witness and seeking to bring glory to God. Everything you and I possess belongs to God. We are merely, we've been entrusted as stewards to manage our lives and everything we possess on behalf of the one to whom they belong. We all have been given spiritual gifts, opportunities, skills, knowledge, and every other blessing from the Lord. In fact, 1 Peter 4.10 says this, For God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. And then Peter says in 1 Peter 4.11, Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. There was a, uh, I, I ran across an illustration that fits so perfectly this idea of doing our part. There was a young schoolboy named Jimmy and he was trying out for a part in the school play. His mother knew that he had his heart set on getting a part in the play, but she was very, very worried that he wouldn't get the part. So he went to school, they had the auditions, and on the day that the parts were awarded, she went to school very concerned. She drove to school to pick him up, and she saw little Jimmy running to her. He rushed up to her, eyes shining with pride and excitement. And then he said some words to her that should remain a lesson for us all. Quote, Mom, I got a part. I have been chosen to clap and cheer. End quote. In the same way God has lovingly chosen each of us for different and special tasks, whatever they are, whatever they are. Maybe, maybe you're, you have that gift of encouragement just to say, that's right, let me encourage you. I'm, I'm going to cheer you on. That's what little Jimmy had. So, you know, I, I call it Pastor Bob's uh, gift bag that I give, I gave you a gift bag a couple of weeks ago with six items in it. Do you remember? One of our men this morning came up to me, said, you know, I was thinking about those six items you gave me. He said, could I trade number five in for two of number one? I said, it's a little too late. But I have four more items for your gift bag this morning. Just some takeaway thoughts to remember. Number one, the Christian life is far from trouble free. Number two, the Christian life is under the control of our Father. And number three, the Christian life is a life of stewardship and reward. And number four, the Christian life will not be forgotten by God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, for God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. In terms of God rewarding, let me close with this story. Henry C. Morrison, 
after serving for 40 years on the African mission field, finally headed home by boat. On that same boat was President Teddy Roosevelt. Morrison was quite dejected when, on entering New York Harbor, President Roosevelt received a great fanfare as he arrived home. Morrison thought he should get some recognition for 40 years in the Lord's service. Then a small voice came to Morrison and said, Henry, you're not home yet. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And though we see through a glass darkly now, there's coming a time when we're going to see you face to face. May we live to glorify you and in so doing experience a life beyond believable. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.